everyone, my name is Mandy Bish. I'm an extension specialist with the University of Missouri. And today I'm gonna to give you an update on some of our research regarding temperature inversions. But before we get there, let's just take a step back and say, okay, well, why do we care about temperature inversions? What happens when we spray during a temperature inversion? And so this is some work that we've done over recent years, looking at dicamba in the air, following an application during a temperature inversion, compared to an on-label application when an inversion didn't occur. And what you can see, this is summarized over 10 experiments, is that we get about three times or threefold the amount of dicamba detected in the air when we spray during a temperature inversion compared to when we spray during on-label conditions. And this is um, important to note, right? Because anytime your pesticide, whether it be dicamba or another pesticide is in the air and not on the intended target, then um, you have no control over what direction it's going to go. And so that's really why temperature inversions are so important when it comes to pesticide applications. Now, what is a temperature inversion? Well, to summarize, it's um, a condition when the air near the Earth's surface is cooler than the air above it. And we're going to get into details of this and take a little deeper dive in a few slides. But essentially, when the cool air is on the bottom, you get the stable air mass. And I really like this picture from one of our weather stations that's equipped to monitor inversions. You can see the fog in the background and the fog, those droplets are suspended in the air because it is a stable air mass. Herbicide droplets similarly can remain suspended in that stable air. So this is one visualization with fog. Um, another visualization that can be used are smoke bombs to show this stable air mass. And so here's our weather station again as a point of reference. And we released a smoke bomb in the middle of the afternoon when there was no inversion. And by 50 seconds after release, that smoke bomb had dissipated. So you can't see the red cloud anymore. Maybe if you strain your eyes, you see a little bit there, but for the most part, that smoke bomb is gone. We came back three hours later on the same day when an inversion had formed. Again, here's our weather station. And you can see that smoke cloud has remained intact 50 seconds after release. Um, so very different. And you know, imagine if that was the pesticide you apply it, had applied, it would be staying intact. So let's get a little, um, let's go into a little more detail about what inversions are. And sometimes to do that, it's easier to explain what inversions are not. When wind, clouds, and sun are all indicators that you do not have an inversion. So this would be an okay time to spray. Basically what happens is the sun is gonna warm the earth's surface. As the earth's surface is warmed, it's gonna warm the air near the, the earth's surface. That warm air is gonna rise because it's less dense, right? Warm air rises and then cool air is gonna sink and cool air is gonna be warmed and it's gonna rise. And you're gonna get the cycling of warm and cool air. That vertical mixing of warm and cool air um, results in wind, which we feel, and is usually capped by cumulus clouds at the top. Um, and so these are all indicators that an inversion has not formed and would be okay to spray. Now, inversions can be caused by many things. Um, the one I'm going to describe today is a radiation inversion because this is pretty common type of inversion over much of our soybean growing region. So radiation inversion is solar driven. It occurs when the sun sets. So if the sun sets, there's no longer um, solar radiation hitting the earth's surface. Over time, that air near the earth's surface is gonna cool. Well, the cooler air is more dense. It's not gonna rise, it's just gonna stay stagnant. And so you have this cap, right? You have this cooler air under the warmer air. There's no mixing, so there's no wind, and there's no mixing, so there's no cumulative clouds at the top of that um, mixing column, because there isn't one. Um, and so, you know, I think many of you are probably aware of these type of conditions, even if we haven't always recognized it as a stable air mass or inversion. You could be um, down in the river bottom and a cool air mass settle in. You can feel it, you know, wish you had a jacket um, because it's much cooler at that river bottom than it is a little higher up ground. Or on evenings where you can hear the trains or the crickets or the frogs louder than normal, um, or you can smell odors uh, more they're stronger than they typically are. Those, those are all indicators of inversions because you don't have air movement. So it's not interrupting the flow of that odor or the wavelength of those sounds, okay? 
So what does this look like? Um, the movement of stable air. So you have a stable air mass that is formed and let's say you accidentally sprayed pesticide into that stable air mass. Well, a lot of how the air moves is gonna be influenced by topography. And I've really become a fan of smoke bombs over the years because they can show you air movement within a field. So I'm gonna illustrate two different fields here where we've really smoked bombs. The first is at our Bradford Research Center in Columbia, and this is a fairly flat field. There's not many obstructions. So obstructions are gonna allow for the generation of wind to, um, to help push those uh, stable air masses. And here you don't see that. You have this uh, cloud that's forming and it's pretty slow, it's just staying intact. And I'm gonna just fast forward a little bit so you can see it's just hanging there, right? So if you had sprayed, it would just be hanging here. Well, we're gonna talk a little more about what happens to a pesticide that's just caught in a stable air mass and suspended, but you know, over time, this, this air could be pushed, um, enough wind could be generated to allow for dispersion of the pesticide in it, in which case the pesticide would just, or the, in this case, the smoke bomb particulate would just fall to the ground, okay? So again, this is an open area and the pesticide in these areas is usually gonna move by one of two ways. So you have your cool air mass with your particulate in it, whether it be a pesticide or a smoke bomb, horizontal wind gusts, which I, which I mentioned. So a gentle horizontal wind is capable of just pushing that cooler air off target, so not where, um, and taking all the pesticides with it that are in that air mass. The other way it can move is due to gravity. So cool air is dense, it's going to sink. Um, many times when we see injury in low-lying areas of a field, you know, one, one reason could be um, due to uh, runoff, which definitely occurs, but another reason can also be due to this cool air sinking to the lowest point in a field. And, and at that point, um, as that cool air mass breaks up, any particulate, whether it be pesticide or other things in it is gonna um, fall out at that site at those lowest levels. So let's look at movement of a stable air mass in a very different topography. This is a smoke bomb we released about 15 miles from our Bradford Research Center, so not very far away. Um, this field though is, is surrounded by trees. In addition, there is a major river that runs near it. This is a time-lapse video, it's gonna go fast. So I'm just gonna describe it first. What happens is the smoke bomb is released. Um, you think that it's gonna dissipate it. It goes up into the atmosphere. You think it's gonna dissipate. About the time it gets to the height of the tree line, then it starts to sink and reform um, and, and then move towards the river. So the river would be the low-lying area. So you think it's gonna dissipate and then you see it come back together and sink. So here it goes, it's dissipating, and then you watch it just go down. And what you can't see from this video is, but you can see from pictures is it goes towards that back tree line, um, which is near the river. And that's what this looks like. So we actually went down into that same field and took um, just some images. So at about 30 seconds, you think that the smoke bomb is going to dissipate. However, by one minute, it had started to reform and sink. Indicative, indicative of a stable air, cooler air mass. And then by two minutes, it had moved towards that tree line where the river is. Um, and this stayed, you could, you could visually see it um, at about five minutes even. You had to kind of strain, but you could see it. One thing I wanna point out too, is that um, the trees on this side, if you go and look at them, there are, um, so signs of possible dicamba and, and glyphosate injury with leaf cupping and some chlorosis and necrosis on the leaves. And those are at heights that are similar to where that smoke bomb started to uh, come back down. And so it just, all that tells me is, and the reason I show it is it tells me that maybe this pattern is not just rare. Like I didn't get lucky one day and come see this pattern that it's probably a common occurrence in this field. And, and I think that um, air movement within a field, you know, um, can have a fairly common pattern unless there's an extraordinary weather event that day or, or rain, that's not extraordinary, but a different type of weather event. So we know that stable air can be a problem. We know that inversions can be a problem because they cause that stable air, but how common are inversions? With funding from the United Soybean Board and Missouri and Kentucky Soybean Boards, we've been able to establish weather stations across much of the soybean growing region not all, but much of it, to monitor inversions. And this summer we'll be over 30 stations monitoring inversions. 
And in some states, Missouri, Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois, Arkansas, and Mississippi, I believe, we've had three years of data. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to build a climatology profile. So, you know, you're not just looking at one year, a snapshot, but you're starting to get a longer term picture. And so these graphs are four locations, four of our locations, and the years are represented um, by different colors. Here's your key up here. Um, so this would read that in Carbondale, Illinois, in 2018 in May, there was approximately 17 evenings where inversions formed. Okay, a couple of things I wanna point out is that first, inversions are common across our geographies. Second, um, Martin, Tennessee and West Lafayette, Indiana, they were putting their stations up for the first time in May of 2018 and they weren't at May 1st, 2018. So we just did not include that data here. It's not that there were no inversions. Um, we just didn't have data dating back to May 1st, okay? And the second thing I wanna point out is that these are very conservative estimates on the number of evenings with inversions. So when I'm um, defining an inversion, I'm taking to, into account, okay, well, what is the accuracy on the temperature probes that we're using? You know, how long does the temperature have to be inverted? So, so these are very conservative numbers. And if anything, they're underestimates of how many evenings we had inversions. And you can start to see some interesting things, right? Like June, 2019, Carbondale, Illinois, there were much less evenings with inversions compared to 2018 and 2020. I and mean, we don't know for sure why that is, but one guess would be, you know, how wet was Carbondale, Illinois in June of 2019? If it's cloudy and rainy, you're not going to have um, inversions form on those evenings. So a couple of things that we've learned over the course of this project is that inversions commonly form over the soybean growing regions. Um, and topography doesn't, it can, but it doesn't always, or it doesn't usually, I should say, it doesn't usually play a role in whether an inversion will form or not. In other words, if we see an inversion form in Southeast Missouri, most of the time you can anticipate that inversions are gonna form at our other locations throughout the state, Central Missouri, Northwest Missouri, Northeast Missouri, and so forth, okay? But what topography does influence is the properties of that inversion. When does it begin forming? When does it dissipate? How intense does that inversion get? You know, I, I mentioned earlier that one thing we've learned is that the more intense or stronger the inversion, the more dicamba we detected in, that inversion. And I like to point out these topography influences by using our Tennessee location. So Dr. Steckel has two weather stations and they're set up within a mile of each other. And I believe the elevation difference is about 30 foot. And what you can see is that even within a mile um, that the inversions begin forming about an hour earlier at that lower elevation compared to the upper elevation and about an hour and a half earlier in July. So this is June and this is July and this is three years of data now from Tennessee. And so that just gives you, you know, that's pretty noticeable, right? So you could be in a field and based on its surroundings, not have an inversion, pull out of that field, go to the next field, and there could be an inversion already forming in that field. Um, so knowing the indicators of an inversion, knowing when it's too still, knowing how the air is going to move if you spray during that um, are all um, pretty helpful when it comes to making applications. Um, because I should finish that point because you can't necessarily rely on a weather station that's 15 miles away to tell you whether an inversion exists or not yet. So um, like I said, you know, uh, if the weather station 15 miles away says there is an inversion, then the chances are your field will have an inversion, but it may not have an inversion yet, or it may have had an inversion before that weather station registered one. You need to really know the signs of an inversion when you're spraying. Um, I'm starting to get this question a lot, you know, so what temperature difference should I stop spraying? You know, if there's a one degree temperature difference, um, is that really an inversion? Or, you know, can I go ahead and spray during that? And when I say one degree, we're talking about the temperature difference between our 10 foot temperature probe and our 18 inch temperature probe, okay? And so this is just a couple of box plots from two sites in Missouri over three years to show you the ranges in those temperature differences. And you can see that sometimes you get some pretty big outliers, uh, but a lot of times we have these lower level inversions relatively, or I should say less strong, right? The temperature difference is not as noticeable. Um, and what I usually say to this question though is, there is not a magical, we don't have a magically or a threshold or a defined temperature difference where you need to stop spraying. 
if it is 0.1 degree difference between those air temperatures and, and it's reporting that an inversion has formed, then you need to not spray in. I think this is especially true for dicamba and our synthetic oxen um, herbicides. And the reason I say that is because it only takes a very small amount of those herbicides being suspended in the air to cause damage, okay? Perhaps with other pesticides, you know, if we could ever figure out a way to run an experiment on this, um, which would be very difficult. If we, if it wasn't, we'd already be doing it. Um, if we could figure out a way to do that, then maybe there are other pesticides you could get away with it. Uh, when you're making post applications, you know, it would take a lot more glufosinate or a lot more glyphosate to be trapped in that stable air. But um, we don't know that information. And the label is clear that, you know, if there is an inversion, you do not be, you do not spray, whether it's 0.1 degree or, 0.5 degrees or one degree difference. So I wanna talk a little bit about what happens once the pesticide droplet is suspended in the air. And, and I'm gonna get into a little bit of jargon here, um, technical, uh, yeah, some technical language. And, and my goal is not to scare you or anything. It's just so we can have a better understanding of why we need to not spray during inversions and why this is serious. Um, so, you know, once the pesticide is in the air, it depends on the atmospheric conditions as to what happens. And one of my favorite quotes from Bradley Fritz, who studied a lot of atmospheric stability and aerial pesticide applications is, the atmosphere is the most uncontrollable factor. So once the pesticide is in the air, it's totally dependent on the atmospheric conditions and the applicator doesn't have control over that. Now, one of the questions that has come up throughout all of this is, do we have enough wind that we can disperse and dilute um, pesticide that is in the air, um, in which case you would not get as much off-target movement because you'd have that pesticide being diluted out in a larger volume of air. And so to illustrate the larger versus smaller volume of air, um, I'm going to talk about the planetary boundary layer. So this boundary layer is part of the atmosphere and it's dynamic. Okay. It moves, it increases in depth, and it becomes more shallow depending on what's happening at the Earth's surface. If you have a lot of wind or turbulence or precipitation, that boundary layer becomes larger. Okay, so why, why is this important? Well, if you have stable air and you have pesticide trapped in it, that stable air, usually um, the boundary layer is shallow. So you don't have a large, the pesticide is going to stay in this boundary layer. It's not moving into the free atmosphere. Um, but that pest, the shallow boundary layer means that there's less volume of air overall for that pesticide to be diluted in, dispersed in. Now we're, now we're still talking about significant um, heights in the air, but, but as that boundary layer shrinks, there's less volume of air for the pesticide to move around in. As that boundary layer um, increases, which is usually during the day because you have wind, then you have a larger uh, area and a larger volume of air that any pesticides could be diluted out into, okay? And, and another way to look at this is, you know, during the day, we typically don't have our inversions. The mixing layer is generated by wind. So how, how high are those vertical cool and warm air mixing columns going, okay? So if you had pesticide in the air, it's gonna get caught up in this and be diluted out, right? The wind is just gonna move it and, and not all in one direction. So, you know, when we have wind, um, you can have some of it move one way and some of it move another way. Um, but if you spray during inversion, the boundary layer, that stable boundary layer, any pesticide in the air is gonna stay within this layer, okay? It's not gonna be moved. Um, and it's gonna stay there until either the next day when the sun starts um, generating wind as it heats the air, in which case then the pesticide will um, either move into that mixing layer, which would be the best case scenario, or as that stable air um, mass degrades, the pesticide would deposit um, and you would have no control over where it deposited. So that would be problematic. Um, another thing that can happen, but um, it's hard to trace and, and is not as likely as the stable air mass degrading and the pesticide falling out of it. That's the most likely um, is that it can get caught up in this residual layer. And that's where you start getting long distance. You start being concerned about long distance transport. Okay. Okay. So again, just an illustration of why we really need to be avoiding spraying during these stable conditions. And I really like this um, picture by Dr. John Nielsen Gammon. So, so when we think of wind traditionally with pesticide applications, we think of don't spray when it's too windy because of physical drift. And, and that's very true, right? No one wants to um, 
be the cause of physical drift. But, but, we, but wind plays more of a role than what we traditionally think of. So one type of wind would be that horizontal gentle wind that can push a stable air mass, which I've talked about a little bit. And, and that's what um, Dr. Nielsen Gammon is showing here. So you have a gentle horizontal wind and um, this cloud that you can see is smoke. Think of it as your pesticide, if you'd like, or smoke bomb is moving horizontally and it's still intact. And you just have that gentle transport wind pushing it away from the source, okay? Um, what we really need for disrupting this is vertical wind or turbulent in the turbulence. And so at the end of this, you can see the dissipation of the stable air because there is turbulence. Okay. So um, when we have a stable condition, we do not want transport winds. We want turbulence to disrupt that stable air. So wind, what do we know about wind in general across our geographies? And what you can see is that um, this is NOAA data and it's at 35 foot above ground. Um, and you see that the uh, wind speeds in June of 2020 were uh, lower in areas that we tend to have a lot of dicamba being applied and we tend to have some issues with off target movement compared to other geographies. And, and this is, there's not a magical threshold here either. It's just, it's an observation. And so this is at 35 foot in the air. And if you look at our, our inversion weather stations, which would be 10 foot in the air, you do see, you know, we have three areas where you have a lot of dicamba being applied and you have lower wind speeds than one of our more northern areas um, in Wisconsin, which is the gray. And these are average wind speeds across the day um, for the month of June. And the similar pattern in July. So you have reduced wind speeds in general. And, uh, and then in these areas, you have a uh, even, less wind. So less wind and more that can being applied in the air. So if you don't have the wind, you're not going to disperse it, right? It's not going to be dispersed and diluted. It's going to be staying in that stable air. So once the droplets are in the air, how do they come out? We've already mentioned the first one. As the stable air mass degrades, they can just be deposited and land wherever they land. Um, air deposits, so gravity or mechanical. And what that means is if you have a pesticide in the air and let's say a horizontal wind gently pushes it towards a tree line, well, that tree line is gonna cause friction with that stable air. And so it would be a mechanical disruption and you would get some of that pesticide fall out of the stable air as it moves past the tree line. Uh, rainfall can scrub out pesticides. You have photo degradation. So the sun is just gonna break down the chemical and chemical degradation where it's gonna be broken down by other chemicals. And, and again, I just share this, it's a lot of information, but just to give us a, an appreciation of, hey, yeah, we really do need to avoid spraying during stable um, conditions. Finally, inversions are not new. So why, why do we care so much about them right now? And, and I think it's really, you know, a few things. First, sensitive plants are really sensitive to synthetic oxen herbicides. So you have to have much less um, synthetic oxen herbicides suspended in a stable air mass than you do other herbicides to have an effect, a visual effect. Um, and we know historically synthetic oxins have been prone to volatility and can return to the air after reaching the target. We don't know the extent of um, herbicide that is trapped in a stable air mass because it was sprayed into the stable air mass or the, the amount of herbicide that moved into the stable air mass due to, vol due to volatility. We, we don't have a good understanding of that. Um, hopefully this year with the introduction of the volatility reducing agents, we might get a better understanding of that. And finally, you know, we have longer work days. We just do than historically. And so we spray later into the evening and those are attractive times to spray because you don't have the high winds, um, which actually has become, is, this can be more problematic, I think than the high winds sometimes, depending on the circumstance. And finally, I just wanna close with some really practical applications. And these are, these are just based on some questions that have come up over the year with different groups as we discuss weather. First, um, just remember that wind direction is reported as the direction the wind is coming from and not the direction the wind is blowing. So if the wind is coming out of the Northwest, you know, it's reported as Northwest, that means it's coming from the Northwest and moving to the Southeast. It's not moving towards the Northwest. Second, I've talked about this a lot with um, some different state departments of agriculture and, you know, wind speed needs to be measured in the field. Um, but when a state department of agriculture investigator is um, trying to investigate claims, they don't have that information. You know, their nearest um, 
weather information might be a weather station that's 35 miles away and wind speed taken 35 feet in the air. So, you know, first the labels require you to take the wind speed measurements in the field. If you can take a picture of the wind speed measurement on your anemometer in the field, then you have a time stamped um, image, a date stamped image, and with the GPS coordinates that can all confirm that that wind speed measurement was taken in the field on the day that you said it was taken. So I think, you know, it is a good practice to have. First, they need to be measured in the field. And second, why not um, just go ahead and document that with a picture. Finally, inversions. Assume that all inversions are meaningful. There's not a magic threshold or, or number um, for when for inversions that should be avoided. If it's a 0.1 degree Celsius or Fahrenheit difference, then, then you shouldn't be spraying. And it's especially important when we spray synthetic auxins. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. And I'm always happy to discuss or take questions. And my contact info is up in the top right. Thanks again. Thank you.